You are now listening to the War Report Podcast Network. What is up, everybody? Welcome back to the College Loop Podcast, episode 56 of the College Loop Podcast. And there's no Daniel Locke today. We are actually recording at a reasonable hour now. TCL After Dark has finally ended its week-long tirade on my uh, sleeping habits. But Harrison Tarr is here, and so is Colin Byersdorf. Let's start with Tarr. Tarr, how you doing, buddy? Dude, baseball's killing me, man. It's unbelievable. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm doing well. I, I hate that I keep missing shows. Uh, I swear they flip our schedule around um, just so I can't be on the college loop, um, which is which is a ton of fun for everybody involved. Um, it actually, this schedule's been out for almost a calendar year, guys. I really can't point fingers. It just it just kind of is what it is. The league tells us what they, what they want from us. All things considered, though, man, happy to be back. NBA Summer League is here. And I know we're talking football first. I know, I know. But, like, if you know me, if I can get just a little bit of basketball – like I'm, I can, I can live, I can thrive even. And then the MLB draft today as we're recording this, um, shout out Paul Skeens, by the way, that dude's a dog. I think he could be up in the MLB by the end of this year. A lot of fun stuff. We're now like not completely dead. So I'm, I'm pumped. <laughs> not a lot of fun stuff in the MLB draft when you get to the later round of that first round, but we'll talk about that in a second. But Colin, how you doing? Uh, I'm doing good. Excited to be here. Uh, just want to retweet what you said about doing it earlier in the day. I'm I'm pumped for that. Not going to sleep <laughs> at two in the morning. Yeah, rock. Me, and Colin, me and Colin can do some actual editing for the show. Yeah, for Colin's once. reconsidering this whole internship deal. <laughs> but let's get started with some football, and we have some big news. Uh, there's been a lot of speculation on whether or not Auburn is going to be starting Jarquez Hunter in Week One because of all the stuff that we're not going to talk about. Uh, if you want to know what happened, just look it up for yourself, because I'm not bringing it up. Uh, but yeah, Jarquez Hunter was seen on Twitter per Brad Lester, a former Auburn running back himself, who's also a running back's coach and a running back trainer. Uh, Jarquez Hunter was doing some drills uphill and putting in enough effort to where it looks like he does not think he's not going to be starting week one, is what I see. Yeah. Tell me if I'm wrong, Colin, but... With how much that whole situation would, you know, like I said, not going into details, like how little we've heard about it uh, in, in, in the past few months and really since the week after it broke. Um, no news is good news, right, on, the, on that front. Um, assuming that the situation is handled appropriately, we're not, you know, not getting in the middle of that and not editorializing there. But typically no news is good news. There's no reason to think Jack West Hunter is not going to be playing for this team in the fall, right? Yeah, the way I see it is is he's the starter until we hear otherwise. And yep. so we've right now we've not heard anything. Like you said, no news in this situation does seem like good news. The longer we don't hear about it, the more likely it is that he will be the starter uh, come week one. And so I think all... seeing him, well, I just think seeing him and work out is a good sign as well. And that dude's just built. It's it, those were, I, I watched one of those the, the workout video you told me about, or you put in the rundown uh, just a minute ago. Yeah. Uh, that dude's built. Also, uh, Jarquez Hunter makes this team better. So, <laughs> not that this stable of running backs isn't deep, but Dylan, you want that talent in your backfield. Oh, for sure. And even if even if Jarquez Hunter was to have gotten suspended, there's no way, with all the other suspensions that have gone on in the Auburn football program throughout the many years that has been around, you probably wouldn't see him for maybe the first half of the UMass game, if the UMass game at all. And you're not really hurting your team by not playing – Jarquez Hunter against UMass because I think Damari Austin is good enough to hold that hold the load and so is Brian Batie and you can't give Jeremiah Cobb off the field either. Damari Austin's awesome by the way. I, I, yeah. I, I just want to ratify that statement for those of you who have never caught on to this. I don't know how I'm very very high on Damari Austin. Um, next year is going to be so damn fun to watch that guy run the football uh, in 2025. It, it's going to be awesome. I'm looking forward to this stable for sure. But, I mean, that guy's just, he's just fun to watch. So, I mean, the, uh, Auburn's in great shape. Good to see Jarquez prepping for well, a presumptive return in 2024, um, as business as usual, as, as, as you might say. Dylan, what else we got on the football rundown? Well, just to go into – we're going to talk about the Georgia Bulldogs in a hot in a little little bit uh, in a game I think right. we might end up just saving for a little bit just so we can get the – Right. Get the get the feelings going, and you know, some mirror what you said about the stable of running backs. I mean, even Colin said against UMass, he's expecting to see I think three hundred yard rushers against the Minutemen, uh, and that being I, I'm pretty sure you meant Demari Alston, Jarquez Hunter, and I think did you say Robbie Ashford too. Yeah, I that, said Robbie Ashford on that one. Yeah, there we go. 
Uh, but before we get to the Georgia preview, which we're going to be getting to in a little bit, SEC Media Days is in a couple weeks, or if not a week away. Uh, and Auburn has finally announced the three guys that will be representing the Auburn Tigers uh, during, I believe Auburn's like the last day of Media Days. That or the second one. It's like we're, we always fall on the last day. We're Tuesday, so we're a week from Tuesday. when the show comes out. Oh, sick. So, And those three guys are going to be tied in Luke Dill, transfer edge rusher Elijah McAllister from Vanderbilt, and offensive lineman Cameron Stutz. So a pretty, pretty decent array. And I, Tar came out and said that he predicted two of these three. Yeah, we've so, talked about this on the show before, actually. Yeah. As soon as Elijah McAllister kind of inked his deal early on, or not deal, but inked his commitment early on, you look at that guy, and I don't know if you guys have ever heard him speak before in any kind of press capacity. You definitely should. Well-spoken guy. Um, one, of the, one of the dudes that gets it. Uh, some some guys do. Some guys don't. That's no, no knock on anyone. He's just one of the ones that, that get it. And then you look at Luke Deal, and he has continued to be one of those guys that, that gets it. Uh, Cam Stutz, another one of those guys. You're just like, yeah, no, that makes perfect sense. And, and good ambassadors for the university. So I, I think all very good things on that and, and good choices there. <laughs> Yeah, and you look around him, and I, we were not expecting a quarterback to be in this group at all. No, you can't do that. Uh, and there's very few teams I think actually just put a quarterback out. I think Tennessee might throw Joe Milton out to the to the Sharks, even though Nico Iamo. Oh, you may take Jane Daniels. Jane, Jane Daniels. He's yeah. he's a well spoken dude. Actually, yes. yeah, very well spoken. Uh, yeah. But I think I don't think either schools in the state of Alabama are sending a quarterback. Uh, just because the you bring in a transfer portal quarterback, uh, one decent one from the Big Ten and a mm, one from Notre Dame. <laughs> I have an idea. How about speaking of, we're going to talk about the Georgia Bulldogs in a minute. They could send three quarterbacks, and they could just just let them just see who see what happens. I, I mean, you want the best spoken guy to be your quarterback. Yeah, and- I mean, who's going to step up and be a leader in the media room, right? <laughs> like, I mean, <laughs> I mean, you can only throw to five star so much in practice before you all start looking the same in the in the backfield. So, and we might as well have very similar skill sets. Like at some point, all right, who looks the best in a suit and that little uh, lapel that we give you? <laughs> <laughs> Which game manager can be the best in interviews? <laughs> That's right. Consider <laughs> and- a draft prep. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Who's going to get drafted in like sixth round for just being just good enough? Which one of you is a future backup to the Oakland Raiders? Like, <laughs> who's going to be the third string behind Matthew Stafford, Stetson Bennett, and then that's your job right there. <laughs> you're right. You're right. That's it. That's it. That's it. <laughs> the 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 Los Angeles Rams uh, quarterback room is slowly looking like the Philadelphia Eagles defense, uh, college wise. But yeah, I think that you picked a pretty good three, and you mentioned. Elijah McAllister. It's kind of hard not to pick a dude who has a four-year degree from from Vanderbilt to be your well-spoken guy to send to the media. And Cam Stutz, a guy who we've heard nothing but good things about this spring, is probably going to fit in very well in the starting offensive line room again. And I think it's him and Jeremiah Wright, like the two that are going to be the two returning starters in this offensive line. And again, Luke Deal been with the team for four years. Has Luke Deal been with the team for four years or five years now? Oh, it's, I think it's, it's five years. I think it's four. Maybe going into year five. But yeah, and you picked a good group of three and you kept it away from anybody that could have been a little dicey to be. Uh, you can't really throw in a running back right now just because your most experienced one is Dark West Hunter. And again, can't speak on what he what happened with him, but he couldn't be. He could not be in media days. Uh, wide receiver room, all transfers up at the top of that depth chart. I think the only other person that could have been in contention for this would have been either DJ James, Nehemiah Pritchett, or I guess I thought any, could have any, been on that any of the secondary, really. I think any of the secondary really could have gone in, in one of these spots. But I, I do think that's probably one of the best trio that they could have picked for this occasion. For sure. Yeah, you, you didn't go wrong with any of those. I the only one that was left out, like like I just said, was uh, I thought that Pritchett may be maybe on that on that group, but I have no problems with this group. Yeah. And I mean, just to get into something that's gonna be happening later on in this month, Big Cat Weekend is getting ever so closer and that was bad grammar on my part but yeah that list is getting ever longer yeah and just to go through the list as a standard now i don't know if this is the complete list this is per uh hfb media coverage on twitter you have five star safety kj bolden five star wide receiver perry thompson five star linebacker demarcus riddick four star linebacker bradley shaw four star linebacker jacorby hopson and then you have 
four four star DBs just to make my life easier for that front. Saquon Zaquan, there we go, Patterson, Jalewis Solomon, who's going to be announcing his commitment later this month as well, or in August fifth. For uh, Jalen Crawford, who's going to be announcing his commitment July fifteenth this Saturday, deciding where he's going to go between Auburn, LSU, and Florida. Uh, Jalen Hayward. Four-star running back Duke Watson and four-star defensive lineman TJ Lindsay are all up to be in Auburn for Big Cat Weekend. Okay, there's a name that we're gonna have to talk about a ton, and and you already know where I'm going with this. And and uh, Big Cat Weekend is so so important for a lot of these guys and all these targets and Hugh Freeze and company. That could be the break make or break moment for Perry Thompson. Let's 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 just completely call a spade a spade here. And this guy is, and, we, and you and I have talked to some people, Dylan, and and I, I read message boards when I can nowadays. Um, and I cannot wait to get back in a position where I can deep dive back into it. You know, I love recruiting. But until this guy flips on his commitment day to Auburn, I'm not sold he's going to Auburn. That being said, all the signs that it just it just feels like the stars are aligning with this guy. Um, it, everything he's ever said about Auburn is and, and the, the way the coaching st- staff handles him uh, his 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 i guess imp- how impressed he's been with with the organization uh, not the organization but the program rather and with the facilities with coach freeze and in his his vision it's almost like we're sitting here like okay great when are you gonna flip and 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 he hasn't and you're fighting the giant the juggernaut across the state perry thompson Here's your quote graphic here for you, for you, Colin, just in case you're curious later. Perry Thompson could be the first domino to fall that could be a huge, huge turning point for the Hugh Freeze tenure. And I'm not saying that it's not trending in the right direction, but if you go snag a five-star out from Nick Saban's hands, a guy that it feels like if, let's be honest, if Auburn could have been working on this guy for another year, he might not even committed to Alabama. Uh, it, it would be tremendous. And I think you'd be a fool to to, to not think that Freeze and company are going to be spending, we'll be spending a ton of time with all these guys on this list. Don't get me wrong. I mean, this big cat list is the best big cat weekend we've seen it, in my fandom or my experiences since dating back to, you know, 15, 16, um, the Auburn Tigers and, and, and really being knowledgeable in that front. But this is going to be the most impressive big cat weekend. And it's going to be the most important for Hugh Freeze. Perry Thompson is the headliner. It's it's like everyone else is an opening act to the band, right? I'm not saying that there aren't other guys that you want to go get. You know that, Dylan. I'm sure you've got some other talking points. Feel free to jump <laughs> in. But I think you would agree with me. This would be a huge one. Yeah, and I, another like big a big thing with Perry Thompson is like that he is very close to Cam Coleman. Like recruit, no one is going anywhere until your pen hits that letter of intent. And Perry Thompson and Cam Coleman are very close with each other. There's still a chance Auburn can find a way to get Cam Coleman from Jimbo. And just going to the other list of that people that are coming to Big Cat Weekend, I mean, Demarcus Riddick, Big Cat Weekend is July 29th. Demarcus Riddick, five-star linebacker, is committing July 26th. There's a connection there somewhere. And he also has another linebacker in his ear, DJ Barber, who has already stated that his primary goal, and now that he's committed to the Auburn Tigers, is he's going to be in DeMarcus Riddick's messages, in his face, talking to him, making sure that he knows, come to Auburn, build something special, fix this linebacker core, because Lord knows Auburn needs it. Still regretting the day we have to do that preview episode for the linebackers. That's going to be very, very depressing. But, yeah, you look in. I, one name that I'm waiting to hear about is Casey Poe, and I wonder if he he's committing on July 12th. Uh, which is as this comes out tomorrow, so that'd be Wednesday. Uh, he's still debating on where he's going to go. I, it's up in the air where he's going to go. It's Auburn, Alabama, Georgia, so all the all the usual names you hear. And I forgot who he says in the top seven, but he's going to be committing. Jalen Crawford again is going to be committing this weekend. KJ Bolden and Jalua Solomon, the big DBs from this class, are going to be announcing their commitment a week after Big Cat Weekend. So. Cannot stress enough how important it is that Auburn shows out for Big Cat Weekend, and you're already bringing in a great group of guys who I think Walker White said it himself. Uh, this is a class that Hugh Freeze has been very adamant about because they are going to set the tone for what his career is going to be like at Auburn. And if you can find a way to flip Perry Thompson, which, I mean, there's been a lot of hype around that as it is, 
I mean, you look at that that big the big four really coming into the 2024 class is Walker White, Fat Burnett. You bring in Perry Thompson, and then you have your starting tight end with Martavis Collins, who we talked about last episode in the tight end preview a little bit. That's a pretty good four right there. And all I'm asking from Hugh Freeze is, yeah, get the five stars, but he's going to do it. I know he's going to do it. Hammer down on getting some offensive linemen. I can't remember. This was the first class I've seen in my Auburn fandom where offensive line has not just been an afterthought. I mean, one of the best offensive linemen that Gus Malzahn recruited, he recruited as an edge rusher and Prince Tega Wango. And he was an edge rusher who didn't quite cut it out. And then he moved to tackle. And then he was one of the best offensive linemen Gus Malzahn coached. I'm finally watching a coach who is putting it his best foot forward and getting those offensive alignment. So yes, I want Perry Thompson. Yes. I'd love KJ Bolton and DeMarcus Riddick to get snatched from Georgia, but I would also like to see some offensive alignment come through as well. And I think what I read off one, one offensive alignment from that list or none, that was one defensive alignment. Never mind. If you find a way to get these offensive alignment to flip, you're in good hands. Agreed. Colin, any, any, any thoughts on the importance, uh, whether it be a specific guy or just overall importance of a big cat weekend? I mean, big cat weekend will always hold an importance in Auburn. It's, you know, our staple event I've seen recruiting in the summer, but I think kind of just what you said is taking Perry Thompson away from Bama. It's taking anyone away from all these big sec schools and showing that Hugh freeze is here to recruit. doesn't matter if they're already committed if Hugh Freeze has his eye on someone and he can take someone away from, from a Nick Saban or a uh, Jimbo Fisher, then that's big. That's huge for Auburn. I mean, look what he did with guys like Connor Liu. Um, I mean, uh, yeah, Keldrick Falk. I mean, it, it, and he did that on a short turnaround. Guys that were already locked in other places. Give this guy a little time like this 24 class has. Now, granted, this is still an abbreviated recruiting cycle. Nobody, nobody get that twisted at all. Still an abbreviated recruiting cycle. But you like to think that Hugh Freeze has 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 made good traction, and he's got a chance with everyone he talks to. I, I don't I don't know yeah. what he says in those in those in home visits or in those you know on campus visits, whatever it looks like, or the Zoom calls we've heard about, like you know Facetimes, whatever. But people are buying what he's selling, and there's an element of being a salesman as a coach, right? Selling your program, <laughs> and man, people are buying it. So um, I'm excited for Big Cat Weekend. Auburn fans should be excited for Big Cat Weekend. It's I think it's going to be a lot of fun. If you're an Auburn football fan, I think that you're you're, you're going to have a lot of fun that weekend. Oh, yeah. And, I mean, just going to more recruiting as it is, I mean, Auburn had a some good news come up for, like, Bryce Kane. I don't know if you saw about on three, boosted him up to now a four-star. So this Auburn class, as it stands right now, is not even what is going to be. If this Auburn class at the end of the fall high school season is going to be even higher up than it already is. Just because I think Walker White is going to be a contention for one of those for that extra star. Joseph Phillips is probably going to get that five star. Just all these guys are going to put up good seasons, and Auburn's class is going to look a whole lot better if this ten commits right here can just wait till after the season. It's going to be higher up than forty eight. Agreed. But the thing about Auburn's class is I've there's been a lot of people that have been a little upset that the class is only at forty eight. It is not because of the lack of talent that he've or the the lack of like stars on this recruiting class. It's the lack of – it's the what, – what, I'm trying to go for a word here. But it's – there's not enough commits. Oh, it's Only, boring. <laughs> yes. If Auburn were to get like three more commits in this class, they would rock it up in the 20s. Yep. There's only, I think, one or two schools above Auburn in the recruiting rankings at all that have a 10 commit – just 10 commits. And – yeah, we the big big names are KJ Bolden, Perry Thompson, DeMarcus Riddick because those are the five stars. They're already, oh, well, besides KJ Bolton, already committed to other schools, and you're just waiting for the flip. There's a lot of names that we don't talk about that Hugh Freeze is actively going at that are going to make this class top fifteen. Like I don't think Hugh Freeze needs a Perry Thompson. You would love to have him. I don't think he needs a KJ Bolton. You would love to have him. But if he just keeps going at the guys that he's going at. Besides those five stars, this class is still going to be top 15. Well, if you go get a blue chip in this recruiting cycle, anyone who still doubts the Hugh Freeze administration is going to shut up. It's, it's fair or not fair. Whether or not that's just is up to your interpretation. Reality is, if you can go grab a blue chip in this 24 class and go and get them recruited, uh, excuse me, get them committed after Big Cat Weekend, 
then your entire responsibility is to perform to your your standards with what you've got right now in 2023. And the rest takes care of itself. There will be ample patience to go around. I know that there's a lot of people that say big game boomer came in Auburn fans the other day and said that the biggest problem with uh, with each school's football program is the fan base for, for Auburn, whatever. Auburn fans will be patient if there's signs of growth. If you can just put together and prove that you can pull a, a diamond like that and and and, and go pull pull your blue chip guy and, and to staple out your first true class, your class, you're in business. And then they, then you just got to go play ball. And I think I think it's that simple. Yeah, and I'm just looking at 24-7's prospects for Auburn and the top targets. I mean, there's seven listed. Uh, three of them are already committed to the Tigers. So if you can just put faith in Hugh Freeze and what he can do with this class, I feel like you can really trust that some of these guys are going to flip. And I looked up Casey Pose. His top five is Auburn, Alabama, Clemson, Oklahoma, and Georgia. So, yeah, battling out with the big dogs who have – uh, in the past, and our lifespan have been in the college football playoffs. Yes. And that's just usually he's up there as it is. And uh, KJ Bolden, Camarion Franklin, five star defensive lineman from Mississippi, uh, Casey Poe, and Jalen Crawford are all those top targets. And I mean, look, just go after that. A lot of four to five stars all over the place. That's this right. class is not done. And I, I understand it was not close to being done. But it also, there's more to this class than those five stars that we always talk about. That's right. So, I mean, even if you don't get K.J. Bolden and Demarcus Riddick and they go to Georgia or you miss out on Perry Thompson and Casey Poe, there are 10, 15 more four- and five-stars that Hugh Freeze is in their ear, in their messages, in their wherever he's DMing and calling these people. Hugh Freeze has not only put together one of the most talented staffs Auburn has had the hot minute, he has also put together one of the, one of the best recruiting staffs. For sure. And I, I think leading the charge with Wesley McGriff, Zach Etheridge, Cadillac Williams, Trevon Reed, Walker White, who's not on staff yet, <laughs> uh, but he, I'm sure he will be at some point. I'm sure he'll be listed as a player coach, uh, director of player personnel and recording personnel and uh, quarterback. And starting Albert quarterback. Dodgers, and starting quarterback. Uh, dude, this class is going to be so good. Agreed. Agreed. So good. Let's talk to Georgia Bulldogs. Let's keep moving. Yeah, I want to keep it positive for as long as possible. I tried to prolong that, <laughs> but yeah. Uh, going into week five of the college football season or Auburn football season, Auburn's going to be hosting the back-to-back national champion Georgia Bulldogs uh, week after. So as it stands, we all have Auburn undefeated going into this game, right? Uh, beating Texas A&M close is what we said. Yeah. So 4-0 going into the Deep South oldest rivalry in a game that at this point I'm sure it's going to be a ranked Auburn team playing a ranked Georgia Bulldogs team just because you have to at this point. Uh, We don't know who's starting at quarterback for either one of the teams. We can assume Peyton Thorne and we can assume Carson Beck. Carson Beck. That's going to be the usual one. Uh, uh, George is coming off of another top three recruiting class. I believe top two uh, at that as well. Uh, Yeah. Uh, Tar, I'm going to let you take take this one away first. Really, really kind of you, Dylan. I appreciate that. (laughs) Um, I didn't look up stats for this game. Just, just let I'm, that know. If, 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 if I'm looking down, it looks like I'm on my phone. I'm, I've got the Georgia depth chart. That's actually what I've been kind of pulling up and, and sipping through while we've been talking. Um, I've got it right here for those of you who think I'm not checking my like Snapchat or something. I'm not. <laughs> um, so when, when you look at a game like this and, and, and a series that has been pretty damn lopsided uh, over the past decade, let's, let's, just, let's just be honest. Um, and, and, you, and you note the fact that, and you all know that this pains me more than anything in the world to acknowledge, George in the middle of a dynasty. Uh, it, it, it just is what it is, folks. It's undeniable. Um, Georgia is now the gold standard of college football. That, that's also true. And, and I'm gaslighting myself here because it, it, it hurts. But when you look at the weaknesses that Georgia brings to the table, guys, there's not a lot. There's really not a lot. Uh, you, you look look at the the group that that they're bringing back just on the offensive side of the ball, skill positions alone. You're bringing back Brock Bowers, Lad McConkey, and then a, a slew of talented receivers. That offensive line, we know what they can do. We know who they are. Um, and, and then you flip over to the defensive side, and there's just not a lot of like youth, <laughs> not a lot of new guys, uh, new faces to the program, and you, you start looking for weaknesses, and it's the quarterback position. But what's been Georgia's weakness the past two years? The damn quarterback position. 
Uh, let, let's be honest. I mean, nobody's sit here, sitting here and arguing that Stetson Bennett's a top five college quarterback of all time. No one's even going to top fi- top 50. Let's be honest. Let's be honest. So you've got this great battle of mid at the quarterback position in, in, in Athens, Georgia. Carson Beck being the presumptive starter. Saw the most minutes behind uh, he who must not be named, Stetson Bennett. Um, Stetson Bennett, you all remember the Ozuna from the Braves meme. There, there should be a Stetson Bennett from the Bulldogs meme from what happened out in Texas, but I'm not going there. Um, Carson Beck being your starter quarterback, the, everyone's truth, who I've yet to see be the truth, and Brock Vandegrift uh, as, as the backup because he was so damn good, but he couldn't win the starting do- job at Georgia, even though he's apparently still in it. And Gunnar Stockton, the redshirt freshman, who is also the truth, um, who still has not beat out Carson Beck, which once again, I think the battle of mid. All this to say, Auburn does not line up well against this team. It, 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 there's just no way to sit here and spin zone it. And and the thing about this, and Georgia has gotten away with this for the past couple of years, and they will continue to get away with it if they keep building the program the way that they do. Alabama did it for years, is they can win championships with a game win- manager. Dylan, you've, as long as you've known me, I have died on the hill that you can win national championships with an average quarterback. People have been doing it for years. A.J. McCarron has one. Greg McElroy. Greg McElroy, Scott. Jake Coker. <laughs> Jake Coker. There, you, uh, there's a trend here. <laughs> but but also at the same time, you can win national championships with an average quarterback. And, I mean, Georgia's just kind of mastered that art. And, and, and unfortunately for a lot of Auburn fans, I actually do think they just picked up a quarterback that's going to be an X factor. I don't even want to talk about that. Uh, a couple days ago. I, I do, unfortunately. Love his film. But all this to say, I just cannot find a way to spin zone this one. Dylan, where I even think this game's particularly close. Yeah, uh, I'm just gonna, if I go into it, uh, Auburn's currently on a six-game losing streak versus versus Georgia. Definitely need a win at some point in the near future. Uh, you'd hope this year. Uh, Auburn is currently 1-9 and nine in the last 10 matchups versus the Georgia Bulldogs. Yep. Uh, and that's counting SC championships as well. So that that sounds like a lot long time. It, yeah. Uh, last matchup versus versus the Georgia Bulldogs was forty two to ten. A team coached by Brian Harson. Yeah, this game is going to be rough. I'm looking at the position by that position. That was a fake breakdown. punt game, right? I'm not making that up. Do what? That was the Brian Harson fake punt, right? Did that happen last year? I was. I was. It, uh, happened, it happened last year, but was it against Georgia? Yeah. Okay. When the game was still relatively close. <laughs> So uh, the first yes. quarter, yeah, 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 I remember that now. Yeah, that hit. Yep, yep, yeah. I'm looking. I'm um, so I'm Im- imagining a participant position breakdown of the of the two squads. And as it stands right now, the quarterbacks. I would. I don't know who I'd favor more in the quarterback room Georgia. right there. You'd favor Georgia over Peyton Thorne because I feel like you have more film. Hmm? Well, I would. I wouldn't have said like Stetson Bennett's a better quarterback than like. I don't, I don't know at the time. Anybody, I wouldn't put like, but I feel like quarterbacks are relatively close, and and the, in terms of like looking at sure. position and position. Go ahead. Running backs, I think you favor Auburn, but offensive line, a heavy Georgia lean. Wide receivers, Georgia. D line, Georgia. Linebackers, holy crap, Georgia. Corners and safeties, I feel relatively close. That in that regard is where I will agree with you the most. Outside of the running back room, which I think you give to Auburn, yeah, there is a serious argument for the Auburn DB room. Oh yeah, and by that point in the season, there's going to be, a, in my opinion, a legitimate argument. Yeah, because you're going into a game where at this in our in our world that we've already built, Auburn has shut down the Texas A&M passing game led by Bob Petrino, uh, with names like DJ James, Donovan Kaufman, Nehemiah Pritchett, Keontae Scott, Jalen Simpson. Names like that are in this Auburn defensive Kindly. back room. Do what? Kindly. Kindly. Yeah, for, I almost forgot about your boy <laughs> for a second. And we talked about him with the recruiting thing, flipping a guy from Ohio State. But, yeah, the secondary is like the one position where I think you could argue either way more so. Uh, and, I, and I think the only thing that gives Georgia the lean is the fact that they have a championship winning resume in that secondary room. Uh, and I mean, it's a Georgia defense, and Georgia's always been known for their defense. And I think again, and Kirby running, Smart is just brilliant at defensive game planning. Let's just be honest. Yeah, he is. And and again, like you said, running back is probably the only position where I can fully say Auburn has the best running back room out of the two teams. And that's just because I I think it's 
Auburn always has their premier back. Georgia has not had a premier back since Nick Chubb and Sonny Michelle, really. Uh, that's been like their two premier running backs. Or DeAndre Swift. DeAndre Swift was after them. There we go. But actually, that's always it's been a running back by committee the past few years that they've won the championship just because you know you don't have to really run the ball when you have a six foot seven, uh, two hundred and eighty pound tight end named Brock Bowers who can run a four three forty if he tried. Uh, and, an, how, and another tight end that could literally just line up as as another lineman. Yeah, uh, and I'm forgetting his name as we speak. Uh, uh, he is in the NFL. <laughs> yeah. Luckily, he's in the NFL. Uh, yeah, I don't. There's not a lot that I can really say in Auburn's favor in this game. Uh, it's going to be hard to run the ball. Uh, you hope Auburn's O line. Auburn's O line is much much improved, but again, this Georgia defense doesn't really matter. It's going to be tough to run the ball. Care. <laughs> yeah. It's going to be tough to run the ball. Uh, you're going to try to keep all four uh, running backs fresh this game because you're just itching for that bye week after this game. I, I think it's going to be a whole lot closer than last year. And yeah. I say that you're looking at the score being a 32-point deficit. I think still double-digit win for Georgia, but I don't think 30 points. That's where I'm standing. Colin, are you going to bring any optimism here? Um, No. <laughs> <laughs> Straight up, no. Uh, I think this is a game that obviously Georgia is in the middle of their dynasty, and Auburn is a program that is is rebuilding, rebuilding well, but rebuilding. Um, I think it's not crazy to say that this will be probably an Auburn loss. I think the fact that it's here in Jordan Hare um, will be good, especially if we're four and zero heading into the Georgia game. That'll be a great environment. And that might have have some factor if that's our one positive sin we'll put on it. Um, I think fans will be ready to go, but I think in terms of head to head, position by position, I think you guys are right. We we outmatch them running back and like you said, maybe DB. But other than that, I think Georgia's got our number. There is one other spin zone if if you're looking for one. And I'm not advising Auburn fans. I'm not advising you buy into any spin zone ever because the worst thing you can get in this situation is hope. And I'm being candid. Colin mentioned the fact that Auburn's at home in Jordan Hare Stadium. And that's huge. In my opinion, next to LSU, I think it's the best home field advantage in the SEC. I think it is the best home field advantage in the SEC. But Auburn's not won against Georgia since 2017. Georgia is looking to go three peat national champions back to back undefeated seasons. That doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. I'm not saying they can't win the national championship again this year. I'm saying a perfect resume, super, super unlikely. Just statistically, damn near impossible, especially in this in this conference. Georgia is due for an uh-oh, we screwed up game. I don't know that it will be Auburn. I don't think it will be Auburn. But they are due. And if there's something that you want to hold on to, a 4-0 Auburn team coming off of – and under year one of a head coach that is full steam ahead, playing their second biggest rival at home and has the chance to put that blemish on their record. If things are going in the direction that they could be heading, you could almost throw some books out the window that week. I, I, I There is an element of this is the SEC. This is college football. The chaos is imminent. It is not probable. It is imminent. All that to say, I'll go ahead and start our score predictions, Dylan. Georgia takes down Auburn 34-7. to 34-7. to 7. 30, I'll go 34-10. I'll, I'll, I'll let McPherson kick the over. <laughs> so a, a rematch, a repeat of the 2021 deep title rivalry. This one's going to be a beatdown, guys. Colin, I'll let you go. Um. So I like, I like 34. I'm not going to go with 34. I'm going to say... 41 to 17 here. I think it's a little little higher scoring than you have. Um, obviously, the offense probably won't be the, the big thing for either team in the game, but I think that Georgia will put some points up and Auburn will spot. Bonus prop bet, non-offensive touchdown somewhere. Yeah, I think DJ James could run it back on Carson Beck, uh, ending the Carson Beck decade, uh, uh, career. Yeah, era bringing in Brock Vandegrift to throw another pick six, and then Gunnar Stockton comes in. There's another pick six. <laughs> That'd be the weird level. <laughs> but 
But yep. Auburn Auburn runs back three pick sixes, and the Tigers fall to UGA forty two to twenty one. <laughs> but looking at since since the SC championship in twenty seventeen, Auburn has only put up more than ten points against Georgia once. Points. Put up fourteen points in twenty nineteen. Yeah, I bet they had to be in twenty nineteen. <laughs> yeah. And I look at it from looking at Georgia's schedule ahead of the the Auburn game, and uh, uh, Georgia pulled some kind of really lucky straw and a draw. I mean, uh, got UT Martin off the game, start the season. Ball State, they might they might have a tough game ahead of them with South Carolina. South Carolina always a team that gives them fits like that. Hey, South Carolina to Georgia. I is believe like in Beamer State. Ball. I don't believe in Beamer Ball that much. True. Well, Muschamp does have a win over Georgia, though, at South Carolina. Just throw cool. it out there. <laughs> then they have UAB before they come into Jordan Hare Stadium. I'm going to be a little bit more optimistic than than Utah. I'm going to go. I'm going to say the Georgia offense struggles, but the defense prevails. I'm going to go Georgia 27, Auburn 10. That feels right. Like, I think it's going to be an ugly game. So you just think Georgia's going to score one less touchdown than I do. Did you say 40? I thought you said 40. I said 34 10. Uh, I had 41. Yeah. That, uh, I heard the 40 somewhere. I don't think it's going to be as bad of a beatdown as it was last year. Not even in the slightest. I think Auburn's defense is a whole lot better. I think they're led by a, a bunch of better coaches than they were last year. I think Auburn can mimic what they did against Georgia last year, and it'd be a little close up until, I think, maybe the third quarter when Georgia finally finds a way to pick it up a little bit. And it's going to be an ugly game. And, I, I you know, I'm going to go ahead and predict rain just to make it even uglier than it already yeah, is. Yeah, no, that feels right. <laughs> it's going to be rain, muddy. There's going to be a tornado in, like, some field out somewhere. It's going to be ugly. No, that feels right. That's yeah. right. It feels if it just feels right for an ugly game. Give it, I mean, I might give it an uglier score. Auburn, Georgia kneels the ball in the end zone. Auburn loses 27 to 12. There we go. Make it ugly, it. make it very, very ugly. But yeah, yeah, Auburn in our world now is four and one, still in contention for the SEC West, still in very much contention for that as they go into their first bye week of the season before they have to travel. You get a bye week preview. Yes, we're going to get a bye. Does anybody think that Auburn can lose <laughs> in the bye week? Drop it in the comments right here. Like, subscribe, ring the bell. <laughs> well, I guess I can ask a question right now. What does Auburn have to go – what does Auburn do to go into the bye week with a positive, like, mindset before you have to travel to Baton Rouge the next week? Just on, just be four and one. Like, that's all – that's literally all you have to do. Like it. I love it. Win every game that's not Georgia. <laughs> anyway, fingers crossed for that. Uh, you, but yeah, you Georgia, you might win the West. <laughs> Tune in to the next episode of the Game by Game Preview, where we're going to be previewing Auburn's matchup in Tiger Stadium and what's going to be a night game and a ferocious environment that Auburn has bad luck in. I just got live through live on the air. That's unbelievable. What? You, you told me that we were going to have a bye week preview, but that's bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> we just did. That was the bye week preview. That's understandable. Carry on. Oh, uh, yeah. As they go in to play, I believe at this point, a top five team in the LSU Tigers. Oh, uh, yeah, no. Barring, barring what happens right. against barring what happens against Florida State. Because we don't know how serious Mike Norvell is in, in Seminole County. They're about to Seminole around and find out. <laughs> You're not wrong about that. But yeah, tune into the next episode where we're going to be doing another theoretical Thursday as well. Uh, still in debating what that's going to be about. Uh, you can probably assume it will be something. Y'all tell us. Drop yeah. in the comment. Yeah, y'all tell us. Gregor Gregorio has is the only one that's telling us stuff to do on the show. So we need more people out there giving us content ideas. Uh, but Tar, I'm going to let you take take it away yeah. right here. You've yeah, been I'm, I'm dying, up. itching, rabid to talk about this. I know. I, I am I am feral to talk about Auburn men's basketball. But before we do that, let's talk to Mr. Byersdorf for In His Bag. In His Bag. In His Bag with Byersdorf. Colin, what you got? Who's in their bag? So... This one uh, we talked about a little bit before the show. It's pretty easy. It's uh, Jabari Smith scored seventy points through two summer league games. So. Is that good? Yeah, we're we're gonna give it to him. He um is probably gonna get kicked out of the summer league um <laughs> starting starting now. So I hope he had fun, worked hard, learned a little bit, but he's probably done. Okay, rest of the world, 
I'm, I'm talking to you. Auburn fans, I'm glad you're here. Don't leave. Just very quickly. Um, Jabari Smith Jr. might be one of the hungriest dudes you've ever met. I loved his quote about playing in the summer league. I'm 20 years old. Why would I not? Like, it's an opportunity to get better, an opportunity to get more experience at, the, at a high competitive level. Um, first off, you rock. That is just the right answer, period. Uh, and it was not – it didn't feel pr -y at all. Uh, it, it was It was not – it didn't feel like a publicity stunt. This was just like Jabari being like, yeah, no, I want to get better. Um, because his rookie year didn't go 100% the way he wanted to. He was good the last half of the season. Don't let anybody gaslight you in thinking otherwise, by the way. Um, I'm just – just going on the hill. Also, side note, is he rocking 10 this year? Yes, he is. Damn it. A 10 with a little half sleeve on the <sighs> on the forearm. Shoot. Okay. Yeah. Do you miss that tidbit? Uh yeah, I know. I I I was making sure that I this wasn't just a summer league thing and that I I was had read that right. Um, because I definitely have a Jabari Smith Jr. number one jersey hanging on the wall. Hey, right? that's a relic. That's not a relic. Be, that's right, you're right. And it, it'll, it'll be like yeah, it'll, it'll be awesome when he's going to the uh, NBA Hall of Fame and I still have his rookie number. Anyways, yeah, let's talk Summer League for a second, guys. Um, the Athletic li uh, listed Jabari and Shreve Cooper on their all, all too good for uh, the Summer League team. Shreve Cooper's been hooping. Uh, he only had uh, like eight, five, and two uh, in, in, their, in their last win over Toronto, right? Something like that. Mm -hmm. But he had 27 game four, no? In 27 minutes. I mean, come on now. League this man. League this man. Uh, the Cavs have the opportunity of a lifetime to have a small demographic of, of fans in Auburn, Alabama, by the way. Just putting that out there. They have an opportunity. But I digress and, and, and go back to Jabari Smith Jr. Um, what he's done in the summer league is just making people look dumb. And it shows that his NBA experience is there now because he's too good for the rest of this league. Fellas. Colin, I'm going to ask you this specifically. Am I crazy for thinking that year two could be an absolute breakout year for Jabari Smith Jr.? No, you're not, especially the way he played down the stretch last season, his rookie season. Um, just him, I think he's still making the bet. Like, he's getting better. Um, he's only 10 years old. Exactly. He's so young. He's younger than half the people he's playing in the summer league with. Yeah. But – I don't know. I there's a sophomore slump's a big thing in the NBA. I don't think he's gonna have it. I think he's just gonna continue to build and build and build. Yeah, I mean, we certainly saw a sophomore slump with a you know, one of Bari's teammates on 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 the Rockets. I mean, I thought Jalen Green was up and down, up and down, up and down, kind of all year. Um, let's see if we can not make that contagious for for Jabari Smith Jr. Because I do think this guy could be All NBA by the end of his second year. I'm, I'm really oh, yeah. not not disagreeing. His his skill set, Dylan, unbelievable. I mean, I've already tweeted up the college loop account. Uh, just, I, and it's not anything anyone else said. It was all me. Uh, go ahead and lock it in. Uh, Jabari Smith is going to be a 2024 NBA All Star. I think it's. I don't think that's that crazy. I really I don't think don't. it is at all. You go into a summer league, and I mean, for for at least the first two games uh, with Shreve Cooper and Jabari Smith, they were one and two in NBA scoring, just because they put up more points than anybody else did. And, I'll do a little emphasis on what Sharif Cooper and Wendell Green are doing right now as we speak, but we'll talk about them in a second. Because this is Jabari Smith, Jabari Smith, Jabari Smith. He is... We're pushing our as, radical Jabari Smith agenda. Yes. Uh, he is a star in the making, if he's not a star already. Uh, and the Athletics sees that. He's way too good for the Summer League. Uh, he's already he's getting shut down alongside him and uh, Tari Eason. And the Rockets have a, have a chance to be really good this year with a young five around them let's be careful about really good this year they have a very very bright future i uh, they, they they have got a ton of talent on that roster if they can have a little change in command at who's leading the ship they they could be in, in good business in houston pass it from jalen green pass the crown from jalen green to jabari smith let him lead the charge i mean we we've seen in the past the nba the nba teams are very very uh one player heavy at, at some points and if jabari smith can be that dude he could carry the rockets to to uh to the playoffs but he doesn't have to he has Eamon thompson he has tower eason he has it, it with it with the good half of jalen green uh the and the good pr half of jalen green as well <laughs> uh for anyone that understands that reference mm. uh <laughs> the rockets could be good it could be really good with jabari smith leading the helm and really good is a hell of a statement they still have a bench mess i think colin hey. is the same thing hey. yeah uh the rockets are a ways away um, they need to. They need some changes up top. I think yeah, up top, up top, and by, by that I mean office. 
Um, Obviously, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's have Fred Van Fleet coming in. Uh, whether or not you want to say Dylan Brooks is a good player or not. <laughs> give me, I mean, give me three years, and I think the Houston Rockets are right there. Um, yeah. I, I think that it's it's going to take signing the right veterans, but I think you can certainly call and build around Jabari Smith Jr. I think yeah. you could. Um, I think he's proven that. I think he has. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised. Uh, I just don't think Houston's the best place for him. I wouldn't be surprised if we saw uh, a trade after his uh, rookie deal it expires, especially if he plays his way into like a super deal, a super max like secondary contract. I have a team in mind. <laughs> yeah, Dylan, don't push your Thunder narrative. He's, uh, Jabari Smith's gonna be an Atlanta Hawk. I you know. I was. I was. I, was <laughs> I mean, he got to go to the Utah Jazz. I would love to see a little pair up with him and Walker again. That would be pretty <laughs> sick. Never forget the deal to. That- Minnesota swallowed just to give Walker Kessler away and get Rudy Gobert. Anyway, you, you, they they regret that so much. They gotta. They should. They should. Let's let's talk Reef for a minute. Is there a world? And this is theoretical Tuesday at this point. But <laughs> Colin, is there a world where Shreve Cooper actually gets a shot in the NBA? Because if he's not shown it last year in the G League and shown it this year in summer league, like what else are we looking for? I think if he doesn't get it now, uh, he's not going to get it. Um, he's playing really good ball. But he will always – he can't help that he's six feet tall. Yeah. Um, and that is the only thing holding him back right now is that he is six feet tall. Imagine being only being six feet tall and that being a problem. <laughs> yeah, couldn't be me. I, I just I, – I hate to be the bearer of bad news. And and side note, I'll let you plug Wendell Green Jr. here in a second, Dylan. He's, he's been okay in the summer league. He's going to play overseas after the summer ball's over. That's just a statement of fact in my opinion. Um. The Sharif situation sucks. It, 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 like like Colin said, it, it's it's a height thing, and we've really not seen it work out at the one guard position since like it. And I just don't know where he fits, and I certainly think it's not in Cleveland. So I'm not I'm not entirely sure where that where those kind of mesh together because Cleveland's kind of in the middle of a are we in or are we out? And if they're in, he's out. If they're out, maybe he's in. I, I, if that makes sense. Oh, yeah, that makes perfect sense. I mean, looking at Shreve Cooper, Shreve Cooper just put up another eight uh, points in uh, the game that just ended between the Memphis Grizzlies where they just won 100 to 77. Uh, Shreve Cooper shot, didn't shoot a single three ball. Uh, three for 11, two for six for free throws, three rebounds, five assists, one block. So he now has – I we can probably stop there. <laughs> he, he already has three blocks in the season, in the summer league at least. That's crazy. I mean, Shreve Cooper, proving height doesn't matter. Um, I don't know if that's true. That's a theoretical Thursday for you, by the way. What if Sharif Cooper stays another year at Auburn? <laughs> yeah. Uh, a lot of other dudes that could have stayed another year at Auburn that would have really helped uh, that in that season alone. Uh, but, yeah, I think Sharif Cooper, I think he's earned it. He's definitely earned a shot. I mean, if you're scared okay, of it. You may think that he's earned a shot. And, and, and I think Colin and I would agree with you. Le- realistically. Does Sharif Cooper play a game on an NBA roster this year? Yes. For who? Uh, well, he's – I don't know. Where does he plug in on the Cavs? Show me. I'm listening. Just saying. Uh, just saying. I'm, I'm, a, I'm not being a pessimist. You know, I'm an Auburn basketball sunshine pumper certified. I'm just, I'm just looking at this from a – this hurts my soul and I have to accept it. Especially, I'm a Hawks fan. You know how much I freaking hated the, our, our front office for letting him walk? That would have been awesome. He doesn't fit. It, well, it just, I mean, it just doesn't fit. I mean, looking at the roster for the Cavaliers this summer oh. league, I mean, they have two small guards on that team. And to talk about Wendell Green for a little bit, he he got in for six minutes in the game that just ended, and he put up he got three points. I don't think the Cavs are going to shy away from a from a guy. I mean, you said it it was not that long ago. It was what 2017, 2016? When he played for the Cavs, it when he was the MVP As a, runner up. For dog, the that was like twenty fourteen. That was not twenty fourteen. That was twenty sixteen. Same IT year that Russell Westbrook ago. won the won the MVP. Okay. There you go. There's a blast in the past. <laughs> but I mean, they have two guys. I on bad Cavs. We continue. I mean, but looking at it, size doesn't matter when a guy can play ball. If you can throw up shots and make it. It doesn't matter how small you are. You're doing it. I mean, we've seen several stars in this game, guys that are shorter than Shreve Cooper is. The numbers tell us that at this day and age in the professional basketball league, in the NBA, the National Basketball Association, if you will, 
it, height does matter. It, it, it is the staple. I mean, a small guard now, Colin, is 6'2". If yeah, height matters, and that's, why isn't Taco Fall on a roster? What did you say, Dylan? If height matters, why isn't Taco Fall on a roster? Oh, my God. <laughs> let's, He's as tall as it comes. Let's move on to baseball. <laughs> Good deal. <laughs> this is this is getting – I'm losing brain yeah. cells. Well, you're going to lose some more brain cells. The MLB draft is going on. Rounds 1 through 10 are now over with. Get ready for, I believe, tomorrow is 11 through 20. Uh it's so awesome. don't, yeah, it's awesome for some people. Uh, not for me as much because Auburn lost, just lost, or may be losing two big time commits from the 2023 class 20, that will play in the 2024 season. I think that's how that goes, right? Yeah, class 23. Uh, Colt Emerson, who got drafted to, I should have brought that up. I don't have that. Uh, he got drafted, I think, pick 22, and the other, and Kevin McGonigal got picked 22. 33, I think, if I'm reading that. If I'm remembering that properly, I'm going to pull that up. As I'm 22 and 29. 22 and 29? I'm pulling it up. <laughs> Just I... But, I mean, I, I have a huge, huge argument here. Uh, as And, and Dylan, I'll, I'm, let me get this piece out real quick. Yeah. When you have guys that are committed to your program that go in the first round, I still think it's really, really good for recruiting. Like, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm a huge proponent of that, Colin. Thoughts? I mean, obviously you don't have them here, but it's not a full like net negative, I don't think. Like you said, you when you have those top guys that want to come to school here, it shows people below them, like the ones that are to come, um, that this is a, a top program they want to be at. And it's one of those kind of, oh, okay, so these guys wind up going first, second round, third round, whatever, and we can go and play ball right out of high school. I they must have seen something in this organization or in this in this program that said, hey, I can take my game to the next level. Why don't I go learn more about that or, uh, that, that, that organization, that, that club? And I think Butch Thompson is another one of those. They're buying what he's selling. So losing guys in the first round to the likes of, tell me who they got drafted by, Dylan. All right, Cole Emerson from John Glenn High School uh, got drafted one first round, pick 22 to the Seattle Mariners. Mariners, that's right. <laughs> and shortstop Kevin McGonigal from Monsignor Bonner High School uh, got drafted in the CBA round. Consolation. Ah, uh, there we go. Thank you. Pick 37 to the right. Detroit Tigers. That's right. So, yeah, you, you lose two big guys. Kevin McGonigal was number three overall shortstop in the country in his recruiting class, and Cole Emerson was four, both top in their in their states. Kevin McGonigal, Pennsylvania, and Cole Emerson, Ohio. And then you go and lose three guys that are actually on your roster. Uh, two, yeah. the, two that played for you. <laughs> you got Cole Foster headed to the Padres. Yuck. In the third round, and that's nothing against the Padres' like team per se. It's just that organization is a freaking train wreck uh, that that cannot figure out if they're in or they're out, and their pipeline is just not good. So you know what? Maybe that's a quicker pipeline to the pros. I don't really know. Uh, and then you've got Bryce Ware to the Phillies. Where does he fit in that organization? I don't know. Um, just to be completely honest with you, baseball drafts are so so odd uh, because you don't get pulled up quick. <laughs> And it's tough to look and be like, okay, so this farm has seven other outfielders all ranked above you, but they drafted you. Have fun in single A, even though you're 24. <laughs> uh, Colin, which of these guys is the better fit with their respective organization? Is, is it Foster to the Padres or where to the Phillies? Um, I don't think it's where to the Phillies, um, especially just going in that late. I don't, I don't know if anyone's a great fit at that point. Right. Um, you're looking at many years in, in the minor leagues being a, just a minor league guy. Cole Foster going third round to the Padres interests me, especially with just how the Padres are. Like you said, either you're in or you're out. I personally think that they might be out soon, coming from a, a Dodgers fan, so there's a little bit of bias there. They've got to be sellers soon, right? Yes, I think they've got to start selling people. That like, I guess they, they went and grabbed Juan Soto, and he's not really panned out for them, and they're paying Tatis hundreds of millions of a dollars. Zillion dollars. I think they got to be start selling soon, and so he could he could be gone. They were one of their top prospects, but I don't know. You you know the minor league scene more than me. Unfortunately, yeah. Um, <laughs> I just the pot the Padres organization scares the hell out of me, and I say this because it, in the in the MLB it's very uncommon that the team you get drafted with is the team that you go up to to, to the league with, unless you're a one through three round, which here we find Bryson Ware. It's, yeah. Uh, Cole Foster. Excuse me, Cole Foster. I'm sorry. Here, here we find Cole Foster. 
but that pipeline is just so convoluted. And, and then you go through this phase of, are you there to tank? Are you going to continue to try to add pieces that you can't afford and try to compete? Because that means that if you're trying to compete, that your prospects are all getting dealt regardless because you're going to empty the farm. A lot of these guys that got drafted today won't even be in the same club next week, like in, in 72 hours, as, as soon as the, the draft is concluded. It, it's very fascinating to me. I almost hope that he gets moved. And it's nothing like I know you're a Dodgers fan. Both of you guys are Dodgers fans. What the hell am I doing on the show tonight? Um, I, I know that you guys are Dodgers fans here, but it's really nothing to do with the organization as much as it is everything to do with the organization. Like, like I don't understand what the thought process is. The Phillies have a clear mission right now. And, and it is to win and win in the next half decade. And, and they have most of the pieces to do so. The Padres were right there. They were right there. And then showed the entire world that they weren't ready. And now it's, it, it's hard to watch them play baseball. And their pipeline sucks. So it's either going to work now or they're going to have to go spend big money on like an Otani, which I don't think they can afford that either. I, I don't know. It's, it's, a, it's a mess. It, it is an absolute mess on the West Coast uh, for a lot of clubs, but yeah, for them specifically. So, and it's also a good thing about Cole Foster going to, the, to San Diego. Uh, there's not a lot of trees in San Diego around that stadium. So. That's right, and he does not like trees. <laughs> so that's very much does not like trees. But yeah, Cole Foster went round three, pick 85. Bryson Ware round eight, pick 253. Talk a little bit. You were talking about Sam Mongelli for a little bit from Sacred Heart yeah, University. The just transfer. for a second, for you Dodgers fans, for you Dodgers fans here. Uh, <laughs> you typically, Sacred Heart transfer Sam Mongelli, who just transferred to Auburn like a week ago, a week and a half. About 10 days. 10 days ago, a week, week and a half. Yeah. Uh, so that's cool. Uh, another one of those recruiting pieces, right? Well, hey, here's look, the you thing. That. If you, I don't know how the MLB draft really works. Like the NFL draft is so simple with how players can declare and they're in and they can't leave. Could Sam Mongelli still return to the Tigers? Yes. Would you return being picked in the 10th round? Yes. All right. So looking at Sam Mongelli, I mean, he's going to be playing what Cole Foster plays, or either Cole Foster and Bryce Moore. He's going to be interchanging between third and base and shortstop. That's okay. what he's going to be changing between. Okay. Uh, last last season for Sacred Heart, uh, he got 20, 20 touchdowns, 54 RBI from – 20 touchdowns. I love it. 20 home runs. Oh, my Lord. Ah, uh, <laughs> ah, uh, that hurt. I hate myself. Uh, the infielding percentage of 0.907. Oh, that was that's a rough one right there. Yeah, that hurt. <laughs> that hurt to say. Yeah, it really hurt Tar. He's frozen. Yeah, it, it killed his camera. Is what I'm <laughs> saying that. So, yeah, uh, I, I expect him. I, I would hope that he comes back. Uh, I think it's a position that Auburn probably needs to reload on uh, with some veteran presence. <laughs> and it's uh, – and exactly. you watch the draft and – you just lost what would be with Kevin McGonigal and Cole Anderson, uh, three short stops in one draft. Four, if you count, if Sam McGonigal, yeah, I got to start. Um, neither Cole Emerson or Kevin McGonigal were playing for the Auburn Tigers. Oh, yeah, no, they're gone. <laughs> you get drafted in the first round of anything, you're not coming back. <laughs> INR, huh? so yeah, uh, a big question with this, with this MLB draft, though, there's still one Tiger who we expect to get picked, but has not been picked. And that's Joseph Gonzalez, who is still very much left on the board. Someone's going to take Nate LaRue tomorrow, by the way. Yeah. Joe goes an interesting one, though. Has the injury scared enough clubs that he returns to Auburn for a senior season? I think it has. Oh, I'm not God. wishing ill upon him, by the way. I want nothing more than uh, Casey Mize and, and Jogo to wind up on the same rotation, throw Tanner Burns in there and just have a three headed Auburn monster, put them in Detroit all together. So it's more tigers. It'd be awesome. Hey, Tommy Vale's available too. Tommy Vale's there. That's right. That's right. Um, that being said, I just wouldn't be angry if, if, if we got to witness the Joseph Gonzalez revenge tour. Just what's the, what's the cutoff point for an MLB prospect before you're like, all right, I have another year of eligibility. Maybe I should just, Go back to college because honestly, if it's if it's money, I think you make more money with NIL than you do with a minor league. They don't. They it's don't? probably it's probably it's probably similar the same. on who you are. Okay. Paul Skeen made more in college than he's going to make in his first couple of years in the minors. Well, not let's, let's go with the Joseph Gonzalez at Auburn. Yeah, probably similar money. Okay, 
It just well now how late you're getting signed. Yeah, probably you're, you're probably doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah, as because you're going into the day three of a twenty round draft. Right. I say twenty round. Uh, if you go to round, there's CB round A, CB round B, yeah. round two C, round four C, like twenty five. It, it all makes perfect sense. Yeah, makes so much sense. But yeah, top, Joe goes leads the charge on the top tigers that are still able to be drafted that are not. Bobby Pierce is still on that list. Cam Hill, Carson Swilling, Chase Isbell, Nate Howell. Larue. Uh, yeah, Case and Howell's not even listed on the MLB site. Someone's going to take a chance on Nate Larue. By the way, I like I said a minute oh, ago. Oh yeah, yeah someone's they, going to look. They definitely should. Yeah, they should. Someone's going to look and think they can fix him, and they may be able to. Um, if he can swing the bat, okay. I mean, he he could be a solid tr- two way contract Triple A MLB guy. Like who who has the best hitting coach in in the MLB? Like what team has the best hitting coach? Probably, so that's where Nate, that's where Nate should go. Probably Houston. Then he should go to Houston. Probably Houston. <laughs> Uh, then again, Josh Hall, uh, Tommy Sheehan, Tommy Vale, and the last or one of the guys that are uh, on this MLB draft tracker who I think is just hilarious to see Robbie Ashford. Yes, so where will Robbie Ashford go tomorrow? <laughs> Who's to say? <laughs> Who is to say? I mean, what if Robbie Ashford's in line to win the starting quarterback job and gets drafted and goes to the MLB? Imagine. I'm just, I'm just chaos. Anyways, that go down was the wildest things that ever happened in Auburn athletics. I got it. You're still not, there. you're still not wrong. Colin, tell people where they can find you. Love you, support you, hang out with you. Yeah, um, just follow my Twitter uh, at Byersdorf Colin. That's B E Y E R S D O R F Colin. Right, you are my friend. I'm Harrison Tar at By Harrison Tar on the Bird app. If you're not already, like, subscribe, and ring the bell right here on the YouTube channel. If you're watching the YouTube version, like a lot of you do. So what's up? Happy to have you guys here. Make sure you go ahead and do that. Like, subscribe, ring the bell, drop us in the comments. Let us know what you want to hear for your theoretical Thursdays. Tell your friends about us. Follow all of the rest of our friends over at the War Report Fam. Uh, excuse me, I almost said family of uh, podcasts. It's the podcast network, the War Report Podcast Network. So the guys over at the War Report and the Up Tempo Podcast. Make sure to give them all. A huge shout out and check out their work. They're a ton of fun, really good dudes, and really good Auburn content. Dylan, I will be on the Thursday show. Yes, you will. So <laughs> I'm excited about that. I had to and, think about this. And maybe pre recording the D B preview that day as well, maybe. If you're if you're a, available to you. Yeah, I'm down as hell. Let's do it. Because I know how bad you want to be on that as well. Uh, like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I'm Dylan Lark at you boy the tank on Twitter. If you're watching, it's just right there. It's also in the description below. So while you scroll down and go find the Twitter links, you can also like, comment, and subscribe. Leave your theoretical Thursday ideas. Leave some questions for us to answer on the show. And of course, again, subscribe. We are inching so close to 400. So that's a lot of fun. And you can also go follow us on Twitter, TikTok, Instagram, and Facebook. And if you'll listen to us, you have this on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, and pretty much everywhere you get your podcasts. But with all that being said, this has been the College Loop Podcast. 